Affairs of state are no laughing matter, except in the afternoon on WRAL-TV5. That information could only have come from this house. Or well, someone in it. A goofy governor, a hard-headed housekeeper, and a butler named Benson. They stay in a state of comic confusion. That's your opinion. A very good one, I might add. It's a hilarious way to run the governor's mansion on Benson. Greg Fischel makes this the place to be. Welcome to the First Presbyterian Church Hour with services originating from the First Presbyterian Church, Raleigh, North Carolina. Minister Dr. Albert Edwards, Associate Minister Richard C. Brand, Jr., Organist Norman Acker, and Choir Director Betty Fuller. Father, how well we know thy presence around us and within us is very light itself. But thy truth, our Father, if it is sent out, will depend upon those who by their words and lives and lips express it. So may thy Spirit lead us this morning so to send forth thy truth, that to all who receive it and to all who believe it, it will become a lamp to their feet and a light to their path. In the name of Christ, the light of the world, the hope of the world, amen. We praise God with the familiar words of the hymn that is numbered 368. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness, 368.
While you remain standing, let me read the Old Testament Word of God, which comes from the 12th chapter of the book of Hosea. Through the prophet Hosea, God is speaking to the tribes of Israel. And one of the tribes mentioned in the 12th chapter is the tribe of Ephraim. Ephraim, you may recall, was the son of Joseph by his wife, who was the daughter of Potiphar. He also had another son by that same mother, a man named Manasseh. Manasseh was the older and uh, Ephraim was the younger. But there was a time, you recall, when Joseph brought his two sons into the presence of Jacob to be blessed by their grandfather. And ordinarily the hand, the right hand of the grandfather would be placed on the head of the older. Instead, he placed it on the head of Ephraim the younger. Joseph, you recall, protested, but to no avail. But Ephraim, in the early years of himself and of the family that later he was to establish, was to prove to be a worthy man of God. But then, as so frequently happens, in the midst of the blessings of the tribe and of the people, the presence of God was almost forgotten, and they became a very acquisitive, self-seeking, self-aggrandizing people. And it is to this time in their lives that God speaks here through the prophet Hosea and in the words beginning with verse 7 of chapter 12. A trader, this is the description now of Ephraim, a trader in whose hands are false balances. He loves to oppress. Ephraim has said, ah, but I am rich. I have gained wealth for myself. And all his riches can never offset the guilt he has incurred. I am the Lord your God from the land of Egypt. I will again make you dwell in tents as in the days of the appointed feast. You see, Ephraim had satisfied that instinct within all of us, the instinct to acquire. But their goal in acquiring was solely to satisfy themselves, and it brought on them the terrible judgment of God. Present at the meeting of the session this morning was the family, Mr. and Mrs. Joseph Graham Henley. They are being accompanied into the chancel by our ruling elder, Mac Fuller. Okay, we'll let you stand right here, okay? So we'll, we'll let you swap sides, if you will, since we'll be closer. Joe, you hanging on tight? Yes. Sir. Good. <laughs> it was my pleasure yesterday afternoon to visit with Joe and Janice as we were to discuss the baptism this morning of their baby. Janice has been a member here for some time, discussing Joe's spiritual situation, discovered that some two years ago, he had had his own redeeming experience with Jesus Christ. Out of that experience, coming to know that one of the basic, uh, or rather, definitions of salvation is that to be saved is to be set free. And he was rejoicing in that from which Jesus Christ had set him free, and rejoicing in the fact that Christ was an ever-present power in his life. But Joe had never publicly admitted this, or he had to others, but never in the presence of the people of God assembled for worship. 
So as we discussed it, it seemed appropriate that Joe make his own profession of faith as he did in the presence of the session this morning and was by them approved to make his public profession of faith here and then receive the sacrament of baptism. And following that, then the sacrament of baptism will be administered uh, to this young man who Joe is delighted to know will carry on the Henley family tradition. Now we have two others in the family, Jennifer and Ashley. You want to come up and join us here or you want to stay down there? Don't want to embarrass you. <laughs> Jennifer wants to come and Ashley wants to stay. Is that right? No, okay, you don't want to come. All right, you're right there where you can see us. Joe, I ask of you this morning the questions which were directed to you in the, in the session, questions which we discussed yesterday and questions with which the answers to which you are so well aware. First of all, do you acknowledge, as all of us must acknowledge, who know their relationship to God, that we are sinners in God's sight and without hope save in whatever mercy he makes available to us, do you? And Joe, do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God and the Savior of sinners and that you rely upon him and him alone for that marvelous experience of salvation, which is an ongoing experience in your life, do you? And Joe, though these are basic, as we said, do you also promise then that in recognition of what God in Christ has done and most of all is doing for you and for yours, do you promise then that with the help of God you will endeavor to set before him and before all people a worthy example, do you? Yes. And Joe, knowing that there's something about sometimes being in solitude, but there's a great deal to be said for corporate and community life, recognizing then the value of the church. I don't mean just the Presbyterian, but the evangelical church to God's world. Do you promise to support the church in worship and work to the best of your ability, do you? Yes, sir. And Joe, finally, because it's the Presbyterian family into which particularly you receive, do you promise to help the elders and the officers of the church to promote at all times the peace and the purity and the well-being of the church, do you? Joe, may God richly and abundantly bless you as you become a faithful keeper of what you have promised this day and that to which you have firm. For we believe that if a man believes in his heart and confesses with his lips, that man is saved. Joe, if you will kneel, we will administer to you the sacrament of baptism. Joseph Graham, Henley, public professor of your faith in Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. And Joe, we receive and welcome you as a con publicly confessing member of the flock of Christ in the sure and certain confidence that through the power of the Spirit you will remain his loyal disciple unto your life's end, and then by that faith be received into that eternal place where your salvation and the salvation of all believers will, as Peter says, become full and become complete. Amen. Joe, <clears throat> we welcome you into the family of God. You know that. You've been a part of it. I told Joe yesterday after I listened to his witness, that if he were to die last night before I got a chance to baptize him today, I could still bury him as a Christian. And I'm fortunate it didn't come to pass, but that was just <laughs> after listening to him, and uh, we have something here. And now, of course, they present for the sacrament of baptism. The third of that, they have two daughters down here, just as it's, maybe they'll come up sometime later on when they're greeted by the congregation. But uh, Janice and Joe present their son for the sacrament of baptism. And Joe, I ask you a question which is very, very pertinent, and that is, and ask you too, Janice, for Janice has done this before, do you reaffirm your own faith in Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior and look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for your son's salvation even as you do your own, do you? And do you now claim on behalf of this marvelous treasured son of yours, the covenant blessings of our sovereign God, do you? 
And do you now engage him to be God's and promise that in reliance upon the Holy Spirit, you will endeavor to set before him a godly example, that you will pray with him and for him, teach him and expose him to the teaching of the Word of God, and strive with all the help that God so generously will give you to rear him in the knowledge, in the love, and in the will of the Lord, do you? Oh, Joe and Janice, as Christ has led you in these past years, you know as well as I that he'll continue to lead you. And I believe there's earnest intention on your part to bring him into that same saving knowledge that is yours. And to that end, may God bless you and direct you, and direct also this church. And now may God sanctify with his Holy Spirit your child to be baptized, as the word of Christ suggests. Brent, Rollin, Henley, child of the covenant, I baptize thee in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. O oh, gracious God, we remember that thy covenants are made not only with adults, but with every child within their household. And though Brent at this moment may know not of that which has been done, grant, O oh God, that through education and example in the home, grant our Father that through instruction received here and elsewhere, this young man, may grow not only in physical stature and mental stature, but also in spiritual knowledge and in spiritual grace, unto the end that one day publicly he will confirm that what his redeemed parents did this morning on his behalf was right and well and proper. Help them, our Father, to treasure him, we thank thee that they do, that they see him not as a gift, but as a loan. O oh God, in thy providence, may it be a long-term loan, for we believe that mother and daddy have so much to offer him as he grows, even as they make so much available to the daughters who are theirs. And now, O oh God, bless us all in fellowship, in ministry, in witness, and worship, through Jesus, who himself came as a little one. Amen. We, can you come on around here a little bit? We'll let you stand closer to the steps here. Some of those people there need to see you. <clears throat> let me say that Joe is a partner in Exact Cut Woodworks. And uh, you got some building you want done? And you say they're so busy. It may be a little while, Joe, before you get it, but... You know, maybe 87, they'll get to you. <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> Jennifer and Ashley, you still haven't changed your minds about coming up? Okay, but well, we are glad to have you here. But this is, Brent Rollin came to, can you hold him up a little bit? So he came to when we put the water on his head, but I, <laughs> bless his heart, when he recovered from that, he's enjoying a sound sleep. He slept all through the session meeting, which is understandable. <laughs> 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 and, uh, but we... We, we rejoice to welcome him. Uh, this is the booklet that we give, uh, the, and, the, and the cradle cross. Maybe Joe would want to handle that, uh, and, uh, and the certificate. Uh, Joe, one of the promises you made was that with the help of God, you endeavor to live as a believer in and as a follower of Christ ought to live. I give you on behalf of the congregation your certificate of baptism and membership, a marvelous booklet entitled New Every Morning. Wonderful devotional readings prepared by some of the great spiritual leaders of our day and time. And also this Letters to a New Christian, a marvelous little booklet written by one of the great present-day evangelists, Leighton Ford. I don't expect you to read it all in one day. <laughs> but as you browse through it, if you come in at night, I know you're tired from working those long hours out in the sun and all the manual labor. But we hope that in that book, you and your family will find seasons of refreshment. We'll stand and sing, what did we sing last week um, for the baptism? Praise. praise him, praise him, all ye little children. Okay? Joe, we usually sing, blessed be the tie that binds. We would sing, but we'll, I know you would want us to, this guy really loves this son. He's a, 
you know, the other folks in the, in the family are all women folks. And there's nothing wrong with that. But, uh, you know, I guess when a man comes, it <laughs> makes a difference. I better not say that, had it. But anyhow, you know how he feels. <laughs> and he treasures that fellow. And we rejoice that today uh, we've had this high, holy, and happy experience with them as a family. And Joe, we welcome you into this church family as well as into that great family of God who everywhere belong to him and to each other through faith in Christ. And Janice, you know, it's a happy day for us for you two to see the family here together. We'll stand and sing, praise him, praise him, all you little children, love him, love him. we thanked him or loved him, it's all the same. He deserves our both. He deserves our love and he deserves our thanks. Even as a church congregation, we offer our thanks to God, not just for you three here, but for the other two down there. And uh, they'll be at the chancel steps at the hour's close and you'll have opportunity in your own way to come forward and greet them. Mac, you want to go out this way with them, save them, turn around, we appreciate your help. Janice, can you, oh, you can make it, I know. By the way, Janice works for Southern Bell. Going back to work tomorrow, Janice? <laughs> have to lay off with a baby. And good luck to you here. Okay. Bless you. You may be seated. I want you to know that part of the invocation was answered. We got light while we were singing the first hymn. <laughs> now, if we can just get truth, we'll be okay. Thank you. had only begun when I gave him my heart. T'was the dawn of the day, it was only the start. God's love was satisfied by his son crucified. I was saved, was reborn in my heart. But there's more, so much more than that far sweet day. More, so much more. the world could not give. There is joy, boundless joy in each day that I live. I can be what I ought in each deed, in each thought. It's not all it's Christ who lives. Oh, the joy that he gives 
it will not pass away. It will come in your life when his will you obey. Oh, the love we feel inside is because Jesus died. Now it's I who must live for him. But there's more, so much more than that first sweet day. More, so much more every passing day. For the life I now live, God is living in me. In each word, in each deed, each day. how God works so many things together. How appropriate these words of Raymond, following the experience of baptism, both of father and child, reminding us that beyond the actual experience of the knowledge of redemption is that God in Christ must be seen living through you and me in word and in deed. And grateful we are that this is the aspiration and this is the goal of so many. May it ever be a rewarding one and a satisfying one. For our New Testament lesson, from Romans chapter 7, these verses beginning with verse 15, it's so familiar to you. Paul, you recall, is face to face with that which is so common to all mankind, namely the internal conflict in our lives. Knowing the better, but somehow or other at times being driven to do the worse. Aspiring oft times for the positive and at the same time being beset by a negative clamor within us. Knowing the frustration that Paul felt, you see. The things I want to do, I don't do. The things I really don't want to do, by Jove, I find myself doing them. And he writes, you recall, in his own marvelous way, I do not understand my own actions, for I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is, it is no longer I that do it, but sin which dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells within, within me that is in my flesh. I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For if I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do, then if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but again, he says, it's the sin which dwells within me. And then he crawls out in familiar words, O oh, wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? And he answers, you recall, that affirmatively his question, thanks be unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Kathy Ormsby, whose name has been much in the news in this past week, was probably an individual that many of us must, might have liked to know, but never knew in person, only by record and by achievement and by publicity was her name a household word for many. And thus it was that last week, though many knew not the lady in person, there was that sense of despair, 
that sense of compassion which filled our lives when we read in the papers what happened to her there in Indianapolis. And I'm sure Kathy's the only one who could ever give answers that would satisfy, answers that would reveal. But as I read of it, I thought, you know, this again is an indication of that power within us which we know as the power of instinct. Instincts being those drives and those urges which are common to every human being. And the instinct which controlled her life was the instinct of competition. Those who knew her said that she strove to win and had done so ever since she became interested in track when she was quite a young lady. She was what some described as a compulsive achiever. And we recognize that this can be an important factor in life. Certainly, I believe, for almost any athlete it is. An overwhelming instinct at times. And yet, tragic as the result may be in her life, it does not mean that we can ever say that to be competitive is wrong. You see, someone has said that instincts are the raw material of life. And what matters is what we do with those instincts. You see, the competitive instinct is present in all. If it isn't, then that individual from whose life it is absent is almost a dead person. We like to say that what? That competition is the spice of life. Business says that what? Competition is the trade of life. Take com the competitive spirit out of individuals. Remove it from that which is characteristic of a nation. And you discover a people and a nation that basically are stagnant and unfruitful and unproductive. Is not one of the basic troubles with Russia this? that they are not a nation in which the spirit of competition is encouraged within individuals. They work within certain limits. True, they have certain production quotas that they must meet, but there's no spirit of competition where one who succeeds is recognized above those who do not succeed unless it is to be faced with imprisonment. You cannot Im imagine America, can you, being the nation that it is without the competitive spirit that is so much a part of our life. And therefore, it's an instinct within all of us. And if we try somehow or other to destroy it, then we've destroyed an integral part of our, hum of our humanity. Paul knew that. You remember when Paul was conscious of the great physical and material need of the Christians in Jerusalem, where the Jews there who had become Christians were so ostracized, they lost their jobs, they were no longer employable by, 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 the, by the Jews. There was a tremendous amount of hunger and illness because of hunger in the community, and Paul was appealing to the churches in outlying areas to raise money to meet those needs. And you recall what? He pitted the churches of Macedonia against the churches of Corinth. Read 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and chapter 9, where he's writing to the Corinthians and saying, look, I want you to respond to the request for help for the beleaguered Christians in Jerusalem. And he says, I remind you of what the people of Macedonia have done. And that was a rich reminder. For you recall that Macedonia was a section which had been ravaged by the Roman Empire. It was an area where income depended upon the forests and the wood that the forests offered. But the Roman army had come in and had denuded the area. And yet in their own time of poverty and need, they gave generously, Paul says, to the needy in Jerusalem. One wonders where they found it. But even in the midst of their poverty, they were aware of the providence of God 
And in expression of the providence of God, they were to give of what they had to benefit others whom they thought less fortunate than they. Paul says to Corinthians, here you are, a people abundantly blessed. Will you let those Macedonians who have nothing outgive you? And so what does he rely on? He relies upon that competitive spirit, upon that instinct that is within us to rise above the past. Because, you see, this is one characteristic of a human being. The one thing, maybe not the only thing, but one thing that separates human beings from all the rest of God's creation is the fact that human beings are ever striving to rise above the past. If you don't believe it, how do you account for the Guinness Book of World Records? Published years ago, they would publish an edition once every four or five years. Now they tell you what. To keep it up to date, they would need to publish an edition almost every four or five months, sometimes every four or five weeks. Why? Because men and women look at records. And there's something within them, there's a competitive spirit that rises up and says, look, I want to beat it. I want as a human being to rise above the past. Now that instinct can be a deadly instinct or a very, very productive instinct. How do you handle it? You can't destroy it. But at the same time, it can destroy us. But it seems to me that Jesus Christ sought to speak to this point. Did he not in one of his parables that we call the parables of the workers in the vineyard? You remember a man who discovered that the time for the gleaning of the fruit had come. And he went one morning at six o'clock to the, to the marketplace where labor force was available and he employed men to work. He went back at 9 o'clock because he recognized other laborers would need it. He went back at 12 o'clock. He went back at 3 o'clock. He went back at 5 o'clock, one hour before the end of the day, and employed those who were still waiting for work. And then at day's end, he surprised every man who had labored by paying each man the same cost for the day's work. Those who started at 6 o'clock were rewarded the same way as those who started at 5 o'clock. Naturally, it created some unrest. Now, there are many lessons to be gained from that parable, but was not Jesus Christ saying there, look, what matters is whether or not you are willing to do the best with what you have. Why were these other men bypassed as laborers? Maybe they weren't as strong. Perhaps some were incapacitated. But how did he find men still there at five o'clock with only one hour to go? Was it not because those men stayed there, believing that at even at the very end there might be an opportunity for labor and for reward? And Jesus Christ, you see, recognized them with the same diligence and with the same praise and with the same reward that he recognized those who had labored so well all day long. Isn't he saying to you and to me, the important thing in competition is not always that we have to be number one. Sometimes you may be last, and the last is just as great a tribute to you in the eyes of God as is the victory of number one. As that marvelous editorial in A.C. Snow's paper said last night, or was it the night before, saying maybe the problem with the competitive spirit in sports is that we recognize only the one who comes in first. And we forget to offer any applause for the second, the third, the fourth, and the fifth place winners. Only number one counts. And maybe when Kathy recognized that she was eighth in the field and realized that possibly she could not be number one, was this what happened? Who knows? But you see, the competitive spirit was there. It can either destroy us or it can enhance us. We can do our best and know that if that is our best, it is acceptable in God's sight. But that's not the only instinct we have. 
You know, the basic instinct in life is what? Is the tribal instinct. It's to get together. Now, I admit there are some people in life who are made to be loners, but they are unusual people. Most of us, at some time or other in our lives, like company. Now, why? Why do you like to be with others? Well, originally, this instinct, the tribal instinct, the community instinct, was satisfied, what? Because of the need for protection. How do you explain the solidarity of the Jewish race if it wasn't for the fact that they have found through the years of their age-long history that their survival has depended, what? Upon responding to the tribal instinct that if they were to be preserved as a nation, then they must live together as a nation and work together as a nation and strive together as a nation. And all of us have this instinct. But why do you have it? Why? Why do you want to be with others? Because somehow or other there's protection? Because maybe you stand out above the rest? Or do we satisfy the instinct for community, not simply because we can consume from it, but rather because we can contribute to it? For instance, look at the family of God, even this particular family here. What could we do in the kingdom of God as individuals? Probably not much, but look what we do when we are gathered together in community, when we recognize as Christians there's a value to the tribal instinct. And so we pool our resources, not for our glory, true at times for our good, but for the good of mankind and for the blessing of the world. You see, you have a tribal instinct, and I do. You must ever ask, why do you satisfy it? Is it solely for protection? Is it solely because it ministers selfishly to some need in your life? Or do we satisfy it? Because we know that in life we are here not only to be consumers, but we are here also to be contributors. That instinct is there. Oh, you've got what? You've got the acquisitive instinct. Ephraim had it away back there. That was the criticism that God had. God said to Ephraim, look, you're out to get wealth. You slander, you cheat, you put your finger on the scales when you're weighing out goods so that you can say, look, I am rich. Well, you have to be acquisitive. Christ said what? Man shall not live by bread alone. But he never said you could live without bread, did he? How do you get bread in this day and time? You get bread and other necessities in life by labor and by acquiring through your labor. If you're not acquisitive, there's something wrong with you. Said before, you're either a millionaire or you're a pauper. But the acquisitive spirit is there. But for what reason? For what purpose? Jesus, you remember, gave us the parable, what? of the rich farmer. There was nothing wrong with the man. There was so much to his credit. He knew how to farm. <coughs> he was diligent. He was dedicated. He was hardworking. And there was that year when his crops produced greater results than he ever believed they could. And what did he say? I will build me greater barns, and then I will sit by and look at my extensive wealth and say, so, take your ease, eat, drink, and be happy with what you have. You see, acquisition, the instinct was there, and he acquired, but for what? To make his neighborhood a better neighborhood? No, simply to build bigger barns. But then he was to discover that at that crucial moment in life which every individual will confront, that all that his barns contained and all that he had amassed through, lack, through earlier years was of no value. For Jesus said this night, thy soul shall be required of you. He was acquisitive. He wanted what to, to amass, as you want to and I want to, but for what purpose? 
for the blessing and the benefit of others, for the enrichment of other people on earth, for the undergirding of institutions and organizations that really matter? Why do you satisfy your acquisitive instinct? Simply to become richer, as Ephraim says, this is my money, this is my wealth, or to reach out in beneficial ways to other people. But the instinct is there, and you cannot kill it. Oh, there's the instinct, for instance, of sex. That's as normal, that's whatever you say, that's as normal as being hungry and being thirsty. You may not like for me to say that, but it's true. If you're normal, now not everybody's normal, let's face it. But if you're normal, it's one of those things. Why? Why do, you, why do you give in to it? Can't deny you have it. Why do you give in to it? Simply to satisfy some passion? Simply because you're love hungry? Or is it because it's, it's, it helps to seal and to make more firm some special relationship in life? You see, the instinct is there. That's part of the raw material of life. What you do with it is up to you, and it's up to me. Look at the tragedy that the expression of it brings to many people, and yet look at the gladness that other people get from it. But it's there you can't... You've got another instinct. You've got an, an instinct for self-preservation, you know. Even if... I don't care. I, I get, if you're healthy and well, I don't care. Someone told me the other day a story of a man, 103, who, went to the, who, who was being interviewed. And someone said to him, what would you do if you had to do it all over again? What would you do differently? He said, I'd take better care of myself. <laughs> okay, you know, everybody wants a longer thing. You know, it's, that, it's part of you. If you haven't got it, there's something missing in your life. You know that as well as I do. You see, self-preservation is right with us. Christ knew that. There were times when Christ was in the presence of danger. Did he go boldly in? No. How many times do you read that he separated himself from the vengeful crowd and disappeared? He knew there was a moment coming in his life when he had to face death, but he waited until he knew that the hour had come for him to go to Jerusalem. Then nothing could deter him. But he lived, you see with that self-preserving spirit until the moment came when he knew he could spend his life in service to other people. Now, what do you do with your self-preserving instinct? Do you become a recluse? Do you become one who never takes chances? Do you become one who's afraid to gamble? I don't mean necessarily with your money, but with certain things. How many times hear people say, well, I'm not going to see him, you know, he's got a cold and he may give me a cold and you know, all that kind of stuff. How many are worried about AIDS? We ought to be, but, you know, again, we're emotionally bound by that. Uh, running away, say, from nuclear explosions and so forth and so on. And rather than facing up and asking ourselves, what can we do rightly so, you see? You see, the instinct to preserve yourself is present with you. Paul did the same thing. Paul in Damascus, what, was faced by an angry mob. What did they do? Say, Paul, well, you know, you've got to sacrifice your life sometime, sacrifice it now. What did they do? They let him down the wall in a basket. As somebody said, thank goodness for somebody who made good rope. Well, I'm not only thinking you ought to thank the man who made good rope, you ought to thank the man who made that basket. How many of you would trust yourselves to a wicked basket? Some of you had better not. <laughs> you know that any more than some of us, you know. It's amazing how much we did. Somebody said, thank God for those who made rope. Well, who made the basket? If poor Paul had tumbled out of that basket, his enemies would have found If the rope had broken, well, they wouldn't even need to find them. I mean, they would have picked up the pieces. But you see, he left. He was like Christ until the moment came, you see, when he knew that his moment had come to do the thing in life that he came to do. But that's an instinct. And you've got it and I've got it. You see, these instincts in life, these urges, these powers are present with you and with me. For Kathy Ormsby, it was that competitive instinct, and that's there too. And if you've driven it from your life, then you're just, you're, you're just nothing. And any nation that destroys the competitive instinct is ruining itself. 
But the question is, must I always be fast? Or must I recognize that God has so limited me that at times I must come in last? But if I'm doing my best and still come in last, then God be praised. And then, as we said, there's the tribal instinct. Why do you want to be a part of a community? True, there's a time for solitude. Why do you want to be a part of a community? That it may look good on some synopsis of your life, or because you know that through that expression of community, you can be more than just a consuming person. You and I can be contributing people. We have what we said, the instinct to acquire. Why do you want to acquire? You know, why? That you may have the biggest deposit in the bank? Or do you acquire because you want to be a blessing to mankind? Look at sex. It's there. Can't deny it. Are you using it to harm yourself and others? Or in the name of Christ, using it wisely as one of his marvelous tools for cementing a relationship? And look at the self-preservation instinct. Why are you taking care of yourself? That you can be the oldest person in the cemetery at Oakwood? Or anywhere else? That's a great honor, isn't it? Or is it? Or are you preserving yourself because you know there are moments and times when you need to stand above the crowd and witness willingly for him? You have instincts and I have too, and ever they are at war. G.D. Jones said, an instinct is an argument. I had a hard time discovering first, and I may not have discovered what he meant, but I think I know what he means. Instincts are always arguing within us. See, Barclay says, instincts are the raw material of life, and they are always fighting for expression. We simply ask, how will we permit ourselves to express them? We can express them for good or for ill, selfishly or unselfishly. We can let, as Paul says, the presence of Jesus Christ so, so control these lives of ours that these instincts, a part of us, become fruitful in the kingdom of God and a blessing to us all. How much do you argue with your instincts? And how are you winning? Are you making progress? Am I? You've got them. I've got them. Everyone's got them. Raw material, as Barclay says. What happens is how God directs them unto useful, fruitful ends. We can say like Paul, what shall I do? Thanks be unto God who giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Think about those instincts as we bring to God his tithes and our offerings. And right now, that acquisitive instinct is working in your life and in my life. Are you going to give it up? Are you going to hang on to it? Now is a good time to settle at least one of those instincts in your life and decide who controls it, you or Christ.
First Presbyterian Church Hour has been presented by WREL-TV and the First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh, Dr. Albert Edwards Ministry. Join us each Sunday at 11 a.m. for worship. These services originated live from the First Presbyterian Church in downtown Raleigh. The preceding program was paid for by the First Presbyterian Church of Raleigh, 112 South Salisbury Street. You know, growing up in this little North Carolina town, I saw my parents always trying to help people. My dad would pick up the pitchfork.